Welcome again. This lecture, in many ways, simply continues where we with, left off with the last lecture. Uh, we were talking about the crisis of the later Middle Ages, and I talked about um, famine, plague, and war, death, the four horses of the apocalypse. We talked about apocalypticism, tensions that were rising, and I think I also tried to indicate that this was just the beginning of an ongoing period of crisis, which I discussed what that term means in terms of this course um, as well. So, this lecture on political theory, political, uh, what is it, political, what's the title of it? I can't even have to go back and look. Political theory, political power, and ecclesial politics in the later Middle Ages um, is part of that crisis. Now, there was nothing at one level, knew about power politics and about conflicts between princes and the papacy or between bishops and and princes and the whole bit. Um, that was an ongoing factor uh, in the Middle Ages with the most uh, famous and well-known and dramatic uh, example of that being the conflict between Pope Gregory VII and um, Emperor Henry the Fourth, uh, where they uh, Gregory excommunicated Henry, and this is about the investiture controversy and who had the right to appoint bishops. Um, Gregory um, was the big one of the big reforming popes um, of the 11th century, and the reforms even bear his name, the Gregorian reforms, when he uh, introduced uh, clerical celibacy throughout the hierarchy. Um, he condemned simony, the buying and selling of church offices. Um, and then he also did the celibacy, and this was all an attempt to distinguish the clergy from the laity, to say the clergy is different. Now, investiture um, was actually the clothing, the dressing in office of a new bishop. And that had been very much uh, the priority of, not the priority, but the um, the rights and privilege, at least in their own minds, of the princes and the kings and the emperor, certainly, that they could appoint their own bishops. Bishops, as I hope I indicated, were major landowners, um, and they were basically princes themselves. It was only the right of the king or the, or the emperor to appoint those vassals, essentially, uh, in the feudal structure that would be loyal to them, that would work with them and cooperate. Um, but then Gregory felt that we need to really extract the clergy from the laity and distinguish the two. We need to affect what was called the freedom of the church. That was the, let's say, the code word for reform in the 11th century. We need to bring about the freedom of the church. And what did that freedom mean? Freedom from lay control. So that was a battle that had been um, fought already. Uh, it didn't really end in any victory for any one side. Um, and the conflict simply continued. Another outbreak of conflict uh, between Pope Innocent III and Emperor Frederick II. And so it's not that, you know, that there was a unified age of faith where everybody just kowtowed to the Pope and believed what the Pope said in any way, shape, or form. Now, I know I've said that before, but I think I need to stress it again because so often that's the image that is presented of the Middle Ages. And we will not understand really what's going on in the Reformation unless we have a more historical understanding of the Middle Ages uh, and the dynamics involved there. When we look at the Reformation in the 16th century, um, and I'll be talking about this um, later on too, what we really find is this paradigm, this myth of Christendom that I had talked about, this overarching structure that gave the means of making sense of the world, at least within Europe, um, was falling apart. It was falling apart and eventually then fell apart. I think I've already addressed the concept of myth and what I mean by myth in, in this context. Um, I think I also uh, referred to the fact that even if there's this myth of Christendom, that doesn't mean there's not infighting and conflict and 
the whole bit, because there certainly was, even if this myth was one that was shared. Um, but it is one that in this period of crisis was increasingly evident that there were problems. Now, I pointed to some of those inherent problems and tensions, even uh, in presenting to you the basic structures, uh, the fact that the rising merchant class and artisans uh, and the increasing wealth of merchant class and, and artisans and bankers, uh, in terms of feudal law, the three orders were classified as, as peasants. And obviously, quote unquote, they weren't peasants. They weren't simple. I mean, they did work, obviously, but not, they did not work the land as such. Uh, and so there were tensions there with the cities, especially with the communes and the free imperial cities, the cities that were removed from the um, feudal hierarchy and directly under the king, prince or the king or the pope, um, or emperor, excuse me, not the pope, the, the emperor. That caused tensions and conflicts as well. And then with the new monastic orders in the 12th century, which I just, I think, basically mentioned in passing, um, they too became outside of uh, Episcopal control, outside the control of the bishop and directly under the Pope. That started already in the you know 10th century with the reforms of Cluny, a uh, Benedictine reform movement. Um, and then on in the 11th century with the Augustinian canons, um, a group that was trying to reform uh, the Cistercians as well, which was a reform of Cluny. Uh, and then these were all monastic groups that were no longer under Episcopal control. They were directly under the Pope. Well, they were at least under the head of their order who was under the Pope. So that caused problems and tensions. So the fact that there are issues, so to speak, lightly said, um, as we go into the 14th century, uh, it should be no surprise because they had been there all along. What set some of these conflicts in terms of the papal imperial or papal and princely conflicts um, aside and made them different from what had come previously was the depth and the and how far it they went in the conflict. So all of a sudden, there was not just conflict, it was you know, calls for complete domination almost. And there were wars that were fought, and troops were being used. So it's more than an ideological conflict, it's more than simply a, 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 a disagreement about who should have the power. It became such a conflict that, um, let's say, Europe as such, I'm not saying everyone in Europe, but far more than simply the scholars and the people involved, realize like what's going on? You know, what is happening here? These are our leaders, our, you know, our people we look up to. And if they are having this level of conflict, what does that really mean? Now, as we get into the 16th century, this whole myth of Christendom um, fell apart and a new myth started to emerge. So I'll be talking about the, the myth of the nation state. And so the ecclesial politics and the political theory changed and were adapted. I mean, one of the things I'll uh, point to, for example, in terms of being adapted, uh, we talk about the 17th century um, in general terms being the age of absolutism. We have you know, the divine right of kings in France. We have you know, Hobbesian absolutism in England. Um, but this concept of absolutism first appears in papal theory in the 13th century and has developed then further in the 14th century. This concept of the pope as the absolute ruler, at least in many ways. And so those are some of the issues in terms of adaptation, change, restructuring, reforming the whole relationship between, so to speak, the powers that be. That's what we're, we're looking at, and this period is an essential one. And it all kind of begins in the late 13th century with the death of Pope Nicholas IV in 1292. Now, that is not up there on the slide. Um, 
which is okay. Maybe I should have put it up there. I'm sorry if you're thinking, what, what was that again? But what happens in 1292 is Pope Nicholas IV dies. So there has to be a new election. The cardinals have to get together to elect the new pope. The problem was the cardinals couldn't decide on who should be pope. There was a lot of politicking, because if you think about it, it'd be pretty nice to have someone that you knew, maybe someone uh, from your own family, uh, as as Pope, it would be a big boon. So it's a very much a political decision. It's not simply them sitting together and praying and hoping that uh, the Holy Spirit will lead them to the right person, even if that is the <laughs> spiritual or theological theory behind it. It is power politics. Um, and we can see how divisive that can be as we just um, <laughs> watched uh, the Republicans try to elect a new Speaker of the House, which usually was supposed to be a really very simple thing could be uh, end up being one of vicious conflict and in 1292 the cardinals couldn't decide too many uh, political issues too many people vying for power they couldn't really uh, no one candidate could come forth with uh, sufficient um, power political power persuasion to be elected pope so they ended up <laughs> continuing and continuing, and there was a vacancy for two years. They finally made a compromise. And in 1294, they elected Peter Morone as Pope. Now, first of all, we'll see this again several, a couple times anyway. A compromise in an election, such as for the Pope or the Emperor, never turned out well. <laughs> they didn't learn their lesson. Um, and we'll, but we'll see that as we go on. But the idea was this. Okay, we, we'll find somebody whom we can both agree with, who's maybe even outside the College of Cardinals, um, and we'll go from there. And they did. And Peter Moroni was a Franciscan. He was a Franciscan hermit, lived in the hills of Tuscany. He was widely hailed as a holy man, um, as a, almost as a living saint. Um, he was a spiritual man. And if ever there was a pope who was a spiritual man, it was uh, Peter Moroni, who took the name Celestin V. So this is a perfect name. <laughs> uh, Celestin meaning heavenly, heavenly, celestial, and that Celestian was. He was perfectly named, uh, and again, if there was ever a true spiritual man as Pope, it was uh, Celestian. Supposedly he cried when they came to tell him, they had to go find him up in the Tuscan Hills, um, that he had been elected Pope. He didn't want to be Pope. He did not want to be Pope at all. Um, being Pope is a horrible responsibility. I mean, not that I know what it's like. Um, I've never been Pope. I think it would be fun to be Pope, actually. <laughs> I would kind of enjoy it, I think, probably, but that's a whole other issue. Um, I'd rather be Pope than President of the U.S., that's for darn sure. But anyway, um, I think. That could be way wrong. I could, you know, a week after being Pope, I might say, my God, this is the worst job ever. I'd rather be president, but I don't know. Anyway, I'm happy not being either, to be quite honest. Uh, but Celestin didn't want to be Pope. He didn't like it. Uh, there are all kinds of stories about Celestin in terms of, you know, he would issue blank papal bulls. Now, uh, I think I may be, maybe address the concept of papal bull, what a papal bull is. It's not the joke. Oh, oh that's just a bunch of papal bull. Um, uh, the bulla is the wax seal uh, that would seal an official document. So uh, if a pope issued an official document, he would have his own seal. You know, the wax seal, put his signet ring in it, and that would be the bulla that would seal up the document, the letter or the, whatever it might be, the encyclical uh, proclamation. And so it's a papal bull as opposed to a princely bull or other types of bulls. Um, if you think about it, a blank papal bull, that means if you gave it to somebody, they could just fill it out the way they wanted to. It'd be like issuing blank checks. Sure, I'll sign it. You can fill it in. I don't know how much, you know, to give you, so just fill it in for however, however much you want. Go ahead. 
now we'll talk more about the uh, economy of the theological positions uh, and, and the <laughs> theological economy and economic aspects of salvation and all that um, later on but that's what we're really in some ways looking at you know it'd be great to be able to get out of um, purgatory uh, and purgatory actually has only been developed uh, since 1175 was the first um, reference we have to a discussion of purgatory as a place um, purgation had been there all along I mean, that goes back being scriptural the wheat and the tares and all those types of things um, but purgatory as a third place between heaven and hell um, developed in the late 12th century uh, on into the 13th century um, it, it was very important because it was actually for um, those who would, would be saved purgatory was and maybe I already mentioned this it was um, if you weren't uh, perfect enough to get into heaven but you really didn't belong in hell then um, you would be in purgatory for a while uh, but the Pope could issue indulgences to free you from purgatory to take time off of, of purgatory and again this is very much an economic uh, an economic transaction um, you know we even have the Treasury of Merit developing uh, this idea that there's basically uh, a bank a divine heavenly bank of grace uh, or merit um, and the Pope is, is the banker it's <laughs> good dispense of it as he's best saw fit the idea that Christ's merit in his crucifixion and resurrection was so great it was more than needed to save everyone whoever was or ever would be or ever will be so that was like in the bank all that was in the bank and it was for the Pope to be able to distribute now we'll come back to that as well I mean that's putting it in somewhat crude terms um, and it, it was in crude terms I mean that's in many ways um, but we'll come back to that and to discuss that in, in more depth but that was somewhat the significance of these blank papal bulls now that's not really being uh, on top of things, so to speak, as Pope. Well, finally, you know, um, Celestine had enough, and he, uh, in early December, resigned. He resigned the papacy. Um, there was a cardinal, uh, Benedict Gaetani, who had um, helped him to resign. He had presented the case to the Cardinal uh, College of Cardinals. College of Cardinals accepted the resignation because this had never really happened before. Um, but this was a new thing. And there wasn't another papal resignation until Benedict the Sixteenth had just passed away. But when he resigned, there was talk about it. Um, but we'll come back to that as well. So Peter Moroni resigned and, ben and Benedict Gaetani uh, sacred. Now Benedict, I'll be talking a fair amount about too shortly, um, was one of these cardinals who had been trying to be Pope, who had been politicking to become Pope. His family, the Gaetani, um, was a newer wealthy family in Italy. Newer by meaning they dated their wealth only from the later 12th century rather than from the uh, 10th or 11th century. Um, so it, there was animosity against Benedict. Um, all kinds of issues there and, and this is a footnote I'm trying to keep this short because this is something that I've written a lot about and I know a lot about and I think it's so exciting and fun uh, but we'll be here for a few hours if I go into all the detail and tell all the stories and stuff so I'm trying to um, hold myself back somewhat uh, so my apologies if I if I'm not all that successful in doing that anyway and Benedict um, had a lot of enemies, in other words, politically, especially the Colonna, another major Italian family with several cardinals, anyway, a couple of cardinals in any shape, who were you know, working against the election of Benedict. Now, Benedict, though, was a very wily po politician, a very good one. He was a, a brilliant canon lawyer, and um, he had worked uh, his, his, he was worked his, his audience, so to speak, and after Celestian uh, resigned, Benedict was elected. 
Benedict was elected at the end of December of 1294 and took the name Boniface VIII. Yeah, immediately uh, Boniface's enemies started attacking. They said, we have to find some way to get this guy out of there. Now, you can say, wait a minute, why didn't they, you know, why did they vote for him to begin with? I don't know those details, and I do not know if those details could be known. But we know that he was elected. He wasn't in 1292, um, <laughs> until 1294. But then after Celestine resigned, Benedict pulled it off, and he was elected. I don't know what deals he made um, for that, but he got it, so... But they were trying to get rid of them, and they started, the Colonna Cardinals especially, started leveling accusations against Boniface for anything and everything you can possibly imagine. You know, simony, uh, which is the buying and selling of church offices, sodomy, adultery, uh, and on and on it went. Now, what we know about Boniface, some of these charges may have been true. Um... But probably not all of them were, if that makes sense. Um, he was a fascinating uh, pope, and again, I said a brilliant canon lawyer, um, and he's also much maligned, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, they also then started arguing as follows. Boniface cannot be pope, or Benedict cannot be pope, because Celestian resign but you cannot resign the papacy the papacy is not an office you can resign that is god's chosen and so celestian is still the legitimate pope and boniface is the imposter and actually boniface and this is another accusation that they made and we do have these records boniface tricked celestian to resign and what they actually claimed and argued and accused Boniface of doing was knowing that Celestian was a spiritual man and a mystical man. They said Boniface actually went to his window by night and in a grand voice said, Celestian, Celestian. It's like, oh, yeah. What? What is it? What is it? Who is it? This is the Lord. What? Oh, Lord. You don't want to be Pope, do you, Celestian? No, Lord, I don't want to be Pope. Then resign, Celestian. What? I can resign? Yes, Celestian, you can resign. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I, I will resign now. <sighs> That was the accusation, and we have those documents that he was charged with. Um, obviously, I was trying to, to dramatize it a bit, but he w was accused of going to his window at night and, and pretending to be the voice of God telling Celestia to resign. Whether he actually did something like that, um, he might have. We don't know. We can't you know, go back and actually find the documents to prove that he did or that he didn't. Uh, obviously, the Kelowna were throwing everything at Boniface uh, just to see what might stick. Um, so it's also very likely that he didn't do that, uh, but he may have. But that's the situation, and this charge of his illegitimacy was a serious one. He had to prove his legitimacy, and that was a problem because, you know, there had to be a theory. Can the Pope resign? Anyway. To come up with that answer, Boniface um, got some help from a good friend of his. The Augustinian, um, actually by this time he was Archbishop uh, of Bourges, Giles of Rome. Giles and, had known Benedict for quite a while. Giles was a good friend of Benedict's. They had worked together. They went uh, were, went to, on a mission to, to the Paris, the University of Paris, together. Um, Giles had been the head of the Augustinian order. And we'll come back and talk about that uh, next week. Uh, I believe it will be in the Augustinian Renaissance uh, lecture. He um, was the first chair in theology at the University of Paris. He had studied with uh, Thomas Aquinas. He was a formidable intellect and a formidable person um, and a fantastic, well, I'm partial to the Augustinians. Um, 
And Giles came to Boniface's defense and wrote his treatise De Renunciatione Pape on resigning the papacy. And in this treatise, um, Giles provided the um, theological and legal argument for Celestine's resignation and therefore for Boniface's legitimacy. Now, you know, there's no Supreme Court here, right? But Boniface was able to hold on and with Giles's help support his position. But that didn't satisfy the Cardinals, nor did it satisfy um, Philip IV, King of Spain. Oh, excuse me. What am I saying? Philip IV, King of France. I'm sorry, King of Spain. Where is that coming from? Um, my apologies there. Um, Philip IV, King of, of France. Because Boniface was having problems with Philip IV as well. Philip IV needed more money. He had been fighting the English. I think I mentioned this last lecture. Um, the, this is before the start of the Hundred Years' War, but he had been fighting France, had been fighting England for God knows how long. And Philip needed more money to pay his troops and to finance his wars. And the problem was he had already, he felt, taxed his nobility so much. He couldn't, didn't really want to go back and ask for new taxes. So he says, I need a new source of, of revenue, of income. Says, but you know what? What about, what if I tax the church, tax church lands? You know, I'm not taking away from the, their contributions. I'm just taxing the land. So he did that. And Obama said, nope, you can't do that. That is not possible for you, at least not without my um, permission, to tax the clergy. It had never been done. What are we going to do? Uh, Boniface issued a couple of bulls condemning um, Philip IV. Philip IV didn't like that one little bit. They had a reproachment for a, a bit whereby, you know, Philip said, okay, um, if I get your permission, is it okay? And Boniface said, well, you know, in this case, okay, go ahead and tax the clergy in this one case. Um, but it was a major problem. Philip was really upset. Didn't know what to do about it. He's angry at Boniface. Boniface is angry at him. And the thing was, Giles of Rome was stuck in the middle because Giles was also very close with Philip IV. Philip III, Philip IV's father, had asked Giles to write a treatise uh, on how to rule uh, as a prince, the Regimine Principum, um, how to rule. And Giles did that and became the most widespread, it was called Mirror of Princes in the later Middle Ages, translated into all the vernacular um, languages, including Hebrew. And it has never been, though, translated into English, at least into modern English. It has never been edited in the critical edition. Um, so I could talk more about that at some point, what a critical edition of a text is. And so, so and then Philip IV loved Giles. And he even, we have a document where Philip IV uh, donated land to the Augustinians in Paris so they could build a monastery. And actually, it was the second uh, house, the uh, second cloister. Explicitly said, because of our love for Brother Giles. So Philip IV is very close to Giles. And Giles is very close with Benedict Gaetani, but Philip and Benedict are at loggerheads, and the Colonna are at loggerheads. And actually, Giles of Rome is uh, kind of uh, one of the side branches of the Colonna family. So he's right smack dab in the middle of everything. And he's, you know, Gideus Romanus Colonus. Um... He's right smack dab in the middle of it all. And it's a very nasty thing. Now, so what happens? How does this all play out? Well, Boniface has to decide what to do. Uh, it's an ongoing problem. It's an ongoing issue. Uh, the French nobles and, and Philip's advisors are not very happy. They say, we have to get rid of Boniface. We have to get rid of him. And, you know, pfft. What do we do? And to stir up um, animosity against Boniface throughout France, at least among the nobility, one of Philip IV's uh, major advisors um, forged a papal bull, 
or took one of Boniface's favorite uh, bowl of sculpty feely, uh, condemning Philip uh, for the taxation issue, and changed it sufficiently to claim, make Boniface claim that Boniface had ultimate authority in France over all matters of government. Boniface didn't claim that. <clears throat> but that really upset the French nobility. They wanted to get rid of Boniface. We got to get rid of this guy. They team up with the Colonna to have a kind of a two pronged attack on Boniface. Now, there was an Augustinian in Paris, James of Viterbo. Um, they regimented Christianum, his treatise. Um, and this is the beginning of what's called hierocratic papal theory. Um, well, I shouldn't say the beginning, uh, it's not the absolute begin beginning, but it's a new. Uh, a new beginning in the development of papal theory and the theory of the church. Um, uh, it's not just for the Pope, it's for the whole church. And actually, James's treatise has been called the first treatise on ecclesiology as such, meaning was to give a theological explication of what is the church, how is it structured, um, what are the power structures involved, how do they all work together. And that is what James did in 1301. Uh, 1300, 1301, maybe even 1299 is a long uh, issue. If you're interested in that, um, I can give you references of what to read. I mean, I, I'm the one who's argued for this date. Um, it's kind of a controversial argument because it flips the relationship between Giles' um, treatises and James. But I'm convinced by it, but that's a whole other side issue. Um, but what I want you to know is that James is writing for Boniface. The whole issue of papal power, of episcopal power, how they all work together, had been dis debated and discussed in the universities, and it had been for quite a while already under the, no, not under the radar, on the radar. And so James's treatise, which he sends to Boniface, was in some ways an academic abstract treatise that he then, given the context, sends to Boniface. Very nice. And then in 1302, Giles of Rome writes his on ecclesiastical power in 1302. This is the same time that Boniface is saying, what do I do? Philip IV has really gone far beyond what anybody should be able to do. I'll call um, a, a, a council to meet in Rome. So Boniface calls for a general council to meet in Rome. Um, in September, October 1302. He probably had just received, or maybe even not yet received, Giles' treatise. Most of the French cler clergy, bishops, and abbots and things didn't attend. They were siding with Philip against Boniface. They're saying, we're not going to go follow the Pope. The Pope is basically a heretic. Giles was in a, a, a real stickety position. Here he was, Archbishop of Bourges, a vassal of the King of France and, and the Pope. Um, but he was also good friends, he was good friends with both. So he, though, takes sides. He had to take sides. He couldn't avoid it. And he chooses the side of Boniface. He follows Boniface. In some ways, this makes perfect sense if we think about it. Giles also had been, as I just mentioned, the head of the Augustinian Order, the Order of Hermits of St. Augustine which are distinct, which is distinct from the Augustinian canons. I'll come back to that uh, next week, too, because that was an important distinction to make. Uh, the hermits, the Augustinian hermits. Um, and he knew if he threw in his lot with the Pope, the Pope could favor the Augustinians. The Augustinians had not been around for all that long. They needed help. They needed support. The Franciscans and the Dominicans were far more well established and the Augustinians were trying to establish themselves on equal footing. Um, so he thought the Pope would probably be the best idea. Now if he had sided with Philip, you know, the Augustinians, we could probably have you know a pretty good situation in France. But with Boniface, that's for the whole church. No, we don't have those kind of deliberations. We don't have letters of Giles's or or his diary or anything. But you can imagine some of the calculations uh, were very real in terms of making that determination. So, bon uh, so Giles sides with Boniface. He goes to Rome. He never turns, goes back to Bourges. 
council didn't laugh very, last very long. They condemned um, the counselor who had forged the bull. You know, Philip is off fighting in wars uh, in, in, in Belgium. Um, actually, ended up suffering a defeat. <laughs> um, so he's having his own problems. Um, and they just, you know, condemned the forgery and condemned some of Philip, but not really condemning Philip as such. And then left, and Boniface was left on its own in November 1302. Um, said, now what do I do? And he sat down and wrote one of the most famous papal bulls in all of medieval history. It's known as Unam Sanctam. Now, Unam Sanctam um, is the first two words of the bull. And it comes from the creed, Unum Sanctum Ecclesiam Catholicum. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, that's how the first phrase begins. We just call it Unum Sanctum. And here Boniface um, made clear no uncertain terms that every Christian must be directly subject to the Pope for salvation. He does not say that the Pope has the right to dictate what princes do. But he does say that every Christian has to be directly subject to the Pope for salvation. This had been not necessarily um, an unknown position to take in a document that was not an official papal document. It was more of a private document, but that gets to be a whole other um, story and context. But, uh, Gregory the Seventh, um, what's known as his Dictatus Pape, had basically asserted the same thing, um, but that was a private document that was not an official papal bull. Here, Boniface was making this official church policy, so there's no longer simply a theoretical issue of talking about what constitutes um, intervention in the cases of sin. That was always the issue in causa peccati in a case of sin. And why is that a, 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 an issue? Because, well, the Pope deals with the spiritual, right? And the prince, the king, or the emperor deals with the temporal realm. So the emperor and kings have the right to deal with you know, the temporal realm and temporal decisions, and the Pope with the spiritual. Sin is a spiritual issue. Salvation is a spiritual issue. So therefore, the Pope had jurisdiction. So what does that mean? If a prince is going to war with another prince... If the Pope says you can't do that because that's a sin, is that interfering in the temporal realm or is that interfering in the spiritual realm? So it gets to be very complex. But here Boniface is basically making that the official position. What do we do about it? How do we handle this? Um, and Philip took action. He says, this has gone too far. This has gone too far. So he sent um, some of his men, one of his also top advisor, um, said, let's go capture Boniface, we'll bring him back to Paris, and we'll try him for heresy. Because this Pope is just run amok. So they do that. They Small contingent. They said, you know, we don't need that many people to <laughs> capture the Pope and bring him back. Um, crossed the Alps, went down, they found Boniface in his uh, family estate in Anagni. Uh, happens to be that there was malaria r r running rampant in Rome, so he one of us had gotten out. Um, and as the story goes, in this small town, they went to this small little town of, of Anagni, um, found Boniface in his bedroom in his night clothes, his nightshirt. Supposedly, Boniface, when they came, got out of bed, opened up his nightshirt, bared his neck, and said, Here it is. What are you going to do? He was a crusty old man. He was an old man. Old man and a crusty old man and a pretty gutsy one. But they were trying to figure out what to do. Now, they, the whole contingent didn't go into the bedroom, but just, you know, the top uh, leaders. But while they were trying to say, what now, do we just whack off his head right here and now? It's like, no, Philip told us to bring him back for heresy, but he's just sitting here. Uh, okay, what do we do? The townspeople of Anagni came to Boniface the defense, started repelling the soldiers, whereby the, the leaders who were in Boniface's bedroom had to go to help protect their own uh, contingent of soldiers. Um, and they were forced to flee back to France. And they left just Boniface there 
sitting on his, or not sitting, but, you know, on his knees with his, you know, neck exposed. Essentially, it was a mugging of the Pope. Boniface composed himself a bit, went outside, absolved all the citizens from any sins they may have committed in coming to his defense, went back to Rome, and died. Now, we can't say necessarily that this event was the cause of his death, but he was, he was early 80s, I think. I'd have to look up explicitly to see how old he was, but he was, uh, I'm pretty sure he was at least 80, not early 80s. And it certainly didn't help his health. So Boniface is dead. Now, um, this event known as the debacle of Nagni was a shock. You don't do that to a pope. You just don't. You don't care how much you hate him. I don't care what you think about him. You don't do it. You know, if... If we were in a classroom, we're obviously not, but if we were in a classroom, and let's say, um, you know, uh, where are we right now in 2023? You know, President Biden walked in. You might hate Biden's guts, but you'd be respectful of the office. And be, you know, you, you don't treat a president that way. You don't treat a pope that way. You don't, you respect the office, even if you don't like the person who's filling it. Even Dante, the great Italian poet who hated Boniface's guts and in his great divine comedy, uh, put Boniface in like the eighth level of hell. <laughs> That's what he thought of Boniface. But even Dante was shocked by this event. It's like, you, you don't do that. You just don't. What's going on? Unum Sanctum, I may have mentioned it I think previously before, but Boniface used Giles of Rome on ecclesiastical power, uh, De Ecclesiastica Podestate. Um, at times, word for word, for his Unum Sanctum. So there's a very close relationship between Giles and Boniface and the Augustinians, because after Giles wrote his treatise on the resignation of the papacy. Boniface starts giving privileges to the Augustinian hermits and more privileges and more privileges to bring them up equal to equal status with the Franciscans and Dominicans. And Giles's gamble of siding with Boniface really, really paid off. Now, seemingly it would all be well and done, but not quite because things would just continue. Now, I know I've spent more time on this part of it than I had planned, um, but I'll try to get through this next phase of this controversy uh, a bit more quickly if I can stop myself from telling all the great stories, which is going to be really difficult, believe me, because this too is such a great story. Um, so what happens in the aftermath of, of, of Boniface's death? Well, there's a, a new pope is elected, like Benedict the Twelfth or Eleventh or something like that. He doesn't last very long. He dies in office after like ten months or something. And then, in thirteen o five, in any case, Clement the Fifth is elected uh, uh, pope. Uh, Clement, uh, he was French, um, wants to do something that that makes a lot of sense in some ways. Uh, in thirteen o nine, he moved the papacy from Rome to Avignon. Now, Avignon was north of the Alps. Um, it's a French city. It's in France today. Technically, at the time, it was not within the borders of the Kingdom of France, but it was very close. Because his point was, I can't, you know, the, the politics in Rome, the infighting, the the, the f family politics, it's just, it's too chaotic, too dangerous. I can't govern the church from Rome. I'm going to go find somewhere else. And so he just takes up, picks up, and goes to Avignon, and everything is fine and dandy. Um, he also had an ally uh, in the king of Naples, Robert of Anjou. Robert was king of Anjou. Uh, Anjou actually is, um, well, now it's French too, but technically it was a duchy of the empire under the emperor. Um, and the Angevins, as they were called, they had ruled Naples. It goes back also very politically complex how Robert ended up as king of Naples. Um, but he was, but he was also had been named, uh, and as his, had his father, Charles, 
uh, the papal vicar in Italy. Now, what does that mean? That means that um, Robert would be the military arm behind the papacy. Yes, they had this, you know, the guards and stuff, the Swiss guards, but if they needed someone to enforce things, Robert, as the papal vicar, would do so. So he was very involved in papal politics. We have to keep in mind, too, since um, <laughs> going all the way back to 754, the papal states have been established. The papal states being simply uh, the, basically central Italy, where the Pope's uh, d domain to rule, as any other Italian prince. Uh, you know, today, the Vatican is an independent sovereign state. If we just think of the Vatican, now it's a, well, it's not, well, it's relatively small, comparatively, comparatively small, but a big chunk within Rome. If you just take that and blow that up into central Italy, then you have the Papal States that have been already set from 754 on. So it's a territorial issue as well. They bordered Naples, the Kingdom of Naples, because Naples is not just the city, it's the Kingdom of Naples. Um, and so they were close allies. And Robert gets together with Clement and says, we need to make a plan for all this conflict. One of the things we're going to do is at least... Um, get rid of part of the problem. We're going to uh, have a two-part plan. Number one, we have to prevent, we can't do much about the King of France, uh, but we can get rid of the, of the emperor. This emperor potentially is a problem. Um, so what we're going to do is try to prevent the next election of the emperor. The emperor is Henry VII right now, and he's causing all kind of rattle, uh, saber rattling. He wants to reassert imperial control over northern Italy. Um, and so it's potentially a problem and an issue here. When we know what just happened with France and Boniface, we have to protect ourselves. So we're going to say, okay, once Henry is, is, is dead and gone, we will prevent a new election. Because the emperor, as I talked about, um, is an elected office. Now, now, if we can't do that, if we cannot prevent an election, what we're going to do is to insist that the emperor come to you, Clement, to be crowned emperor. So there is no emperor, even if they elect one, until you crown the emperor. So those are our two-part plan. Okay? And it sounded pretty good. Well, Henry was uh, causing issues. And one of the things he said, ah, you know what? One of the problems is this Robert down there in Naples, King Robert of Naples, um, how can I kind of um, neutralize him? Well, he took stock. He said, you know what? Anjou is one of my duchies. Robert has never done fealty to me. So he claimed, and he said, Robert, sends Robert a letter. I've noticed that you've not come to court to do fealty to me. This The, the feudal oath of becoming his man. Uh, I talked about that, I believe. And talked about feudalism, that ritual agreement whereby he would be his vassal. Um, so you must do so. And if you don't, you are deemed a rebellious vassal. And a rebellious vassal, by definition, is deprived of his fief. And that's, again, here, the entire duchy. So it's not just the, the technical definition of one fief being the, the amount of land necessary to support one knight. This is the whole grant of land of the duchy of Anjou that Robert technically held of the emperor, even though he was king in his own kingdom in Naples. Well, what did Robert say? He says, I'm not going to do that. You know, screw off, Henry. I'm king. I'm king of Naples. I don't need to you know, do fealty to you. This is what I have up there on, on the PowerPoint. Uh, it says, you know, the, the challenge to the feudal system. This was one of the most the biggest challenge that had come about to this structure. Because what happens if you are king in one place and but your holdings include being a vassal to another prince? <clears throat> you can't serve two lords, so to speak. You don't want to, you're equal. So Robert says, no way am I going to do that. So Henry says, okay, then I proclaim you a rebellious vassal. Your lands are forfeit and I will offer a large sum of money to anyone who can bring me your head before I get there myself to do so. And Robert's like, uh-oh. Henry invades. 
crosses the Alps, starts going down to Rome, and he's going to be out to Naples. Robert's getting kind of nervous. And then one of these strange twists of fate uh, in history <laughs> happened. That was pretty amazing. Uh, we can, the, the serendipitous uh, events of history and the effects they have. Because outside of Rome, uh, um, Henry and his troops were camp camping, and they woke up the next morning, and Henry was dead. They camped in malaria bed. They had been camping in malaria bed. So he died in malaria. It's, you know, this is in 1314. Henry's dead. Robert says, whew, got on that one. And it's like, hey, man, Clement, now we have our chance to uh, implement our plan, plan A. Problem is, Robert received word that Clement had died. So in 1314, both the emperor and the, the uh, pope died. So there's an imperial vacancy and a, a, a papal vacancy. So what happens? They both have to be elected. Now, the German electors got together, um, and it's a more complex story, too. Um, well, I'll tell a little bit of it, even though I, I am conscious of time, believe me or not. Um, and they elected um, Louis of Bavaria. Now, some of the uh, electors said, we, we were kind of compelled to vote for, for Lewis. We didn't really want to vote for Lewis, so we we're going to hold another election and vote for whom we want, which they did, and they voted for Frederick of Austria. Frederick of Austria is an old man. So there's two claimants of being emperor, but Lewis is positioning himself as emperor. Uh, Frederick is saying, well, I'll be, you know, I'll be emperor here in Austria. <laughs> and, and it's kind of domestically, domestic policy. And Lewis, you know, you can go and do what you want with foreign policy. And Lewis starts acting as emperor all over the place. Um, eventually, uh, not until 1330 or so, does Lewis then deal with and get rid of Frederick. Um, but a lot was going on at that time. One of the issues that Lewis was working on was, again, the same as Henry, reasserting imperial control over the northern Italian cities. These northern Italian cities were independent, fiercely independent, um, and Lewis was trying to, I mean, they're on their same side in some ways, but Lewis was saying, okay, um, I need to, you need to show me your, your, your loyalty and fealty and um, help me out here. And so they're doing that. Meanwhile, there's no pope that's elected. No pope. It took a while. Again, uh, conflict, problems. It went on and on and on. Finally, another compromise candidate was found. Jacques de Cahor, who uh, was the Archbishop of, of Avignon. Um, he had been Robert of Anjou's uh, court chaplain. So he, Robert knew him, and Robert actually suggested him. He was also elderly. He was well up in his 70s at the time, I believe. Um, he thought, you know, he's not going to be around for very much longer. Why don't you guys just elect him? It'll be over and done with, and we, then we can figure things out. And they do. And he takes the name of John. He becomes John the 22nd. Um, and he was also a crusty old man, also a canon lawyer. Uh, and he ended up living on and on and on and on. And one of the things that John did was say, okay, I'm going to take stock of things. And I'm going to try to reassert my authority over the northern Italian cities because they're on hit the border of the Papal States, after all. So there's conflict there. He also says, you know, I have to make sure that Louis of Bavaria, if he's going to be Pope, he's Duke of Bavaria, but if he's going to, no, if he's going to be Emperor, sorry. Uh, if he's going to be Emperor, he has to come to me. That's still that plan B there. And Louis is saying, no way, dude. You know, I'm not going to do that. You're not really Pope. You know, you're playing around being Pope. Well, I'm, you know, being Emperor. So, and John writes back saying, well, you're playing around being Emperor. Well, I'm Pope, you know, Louis, Louis, Duke of Bavaria. You don't have the authority to be Emperor. He says, damn right I do. You don't have the authority to be Pope. So there's going back and forth in these issues and crises. Louis then 